Hi, I'm Tim Ellis. Thanks for joining us for Laneway Live. Tonight's special guest has been named one of the most influential magicians in history. Please welcome Max Maven. <laughs> wow, Max, where are you located right now in, in quarantine, lockdown? I am in Hollywood, California, uh, about two blocks away from the Magic Castle, or as it is referred to at the moment, the shuttered, closed, dark Magic Castle. But it's moot because I wouldn't be able to walk over there to use it anyway. So what, what is happening? I assume they, they, they uh, I suppose, furloughed the staff so they can collect unemployment during this, this crisis. Yes, um, there was a, uh, the full staff was 198 people not counting the performers. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had to furlough 95%. Uh, so a skeleton group of nine people was, was retained. And of those, almost all of them are working reduced hours. Uh, you know, there are things that, that need to be done in terms of some of the physical upkeep yeah. of, of the club. And Joe Furla, who is uh, our ironically named uh, general manager, uh, is obviously still interacting with vendors, even though we're not purchasing food at the moment. And uh, he's overseeing things like making sure the electricity uh, uh, is kept on. And, and uh, there's stuff going on over there, but nothing that we would associate with the actual experience of visiting the Magic Castle. Uh, but plans are being made, contingency plans, uh, since at the moment, obviously, no one has any idea when there will actually be the opportunity to reopen, let alone what the restrictions may be at such time uh, that a club like that can be opened. But we're making plans because if it does happen, we're going to have to move quickly. So we'll see. And what about the uh, awards show? Well, there's no way to do the award show. I mean, it was meant to be taking place in May. Mm. That's not going to happen. Uh, there is discussion of some sort of virtual event, but exactly what shape that would take is not clear. That's really uh, a, a decision mostly up to the board of trustees. Uh, before the pandemic got underway, uh, the Board of Trustees had made the decisions as to who would be receiving the fellowship awards. And the members had voted as to who would receive the, the showroom awards. But those results have not been made public. So at some point, they will be made public, both to the membership of the Academy of Magical Arts and also to the, the magic world in general. But exactly how that's going to take place is not completely determined yet. Uh, I, I think everyone is hoping that by next year, there will be the opportunity to do another grand get together in real mm. uh, physical space, uh, as has happened for so many years before. So all of the nominees uh, are sitting in heightened anticipation this year. 
yes, in the case of the member voted awards for the showrooms, uh, those people, and there would be a total of uh, 20 of them, I guess, uh, have been informed, but they don't know the outcome past the limiting, you know, narrowing it down to five people in each category. Uh, the people who have received fellowships have been told, but they can't tell anyone, which is an odd situation to be in. Uh, but as far as I know, nothing has leaked thus far. No, no. Well, I know one of the, uh, the nominees, of course, is Carissa Hendricks, and you are going to be appearing on her uh, upcoming virtual live experience. Yeah, that's next week, week, I believe. Yes, that's going to be a, a very different sort of a magic show. Um, she hasn't told me a great deal about it. Are you, are you on it as well? Um, I might make a 10 second cameo, maybe. At some oh, point. okay. Um, she hasn't told me all that much, except uh, she made it sound as if uh, it's not going to be all magic. Mm. Some of her friends in the, in the other performing arts, uh, having to do with carnival uh, sideshow type stuff, or, or music or whatever, I think will also be represented. But I haven't really found out that much information yet. Well, I think it's good that uh, with this whole new discovery of Zoom and virtual shows, online shows, and everyone's becoming their own TV station, people are trying different approaches and they're trying different mm -hmm. things. Uh, and maybe, uh, maybe there could be some sort of way of doing the AMA Awards uh, in that way. I know that we're going to be trying to do our Australian Magic Championships online uh, as a uh -huh. live Facebook event too. That, but that's not till July, so we've got a bit of time right. to, to get it right. And that involves uh, stage magicians as well. Mm -hmm. So that would require some fairly complicated logistics, I would think. Yeah, um, but I, th I think we've got a. I think we've got a few solutions to it. I've got a very good friend who who runs a, a video production company, and he's he's got his finger on the pulse, which should should make it easier. Uh, the question, of course, is because uh, I mean, this Australian Magic Championships is not really our. FISM Oceania Championships, but right. uh, it's sort of a similar type of thing. Um, but the uh, North America Championships, the, the Latin America Championships, European Championships, the Asian Championships have all been postponed at the moment. Mm -hmm. And they're talking about running them, uh, I think some, some people say November, which I don't think will happen. And other people have said, well, we think we might just run them in June and then have FISM in July. I assume you've heard all these crazy theories. Um, I've heard that. I've heard other things as well, including some people saying everything should be shifted a year forward mm -hmm. so that in 2021, when FISM would ordinarily take place, uh, that's when the, the pre-FISM events will happen. The, the uh, Continentals? Yes, exactly. The Continental uh, Qualifying Championships, yeah. if you will. That sounds nice. And then in 2022 would be FISM itself. Mm. much as the Olympics are going to still take place, but at least a year late. Mm. So that seems to be a viable idea for FISM. Uh, but of course, does that mean that the same conditions are available that were made available for next year in terms of the use of the, uh, uh, the convention center, but also mm arrangements that have made with that have been made with area restaurants and hotels and all of that I know. It, it quickly becomes exponentially more elaborate than than it seems at first and then uh, we have the, uh, the the theory that's being circulated by eric eswin and witters wit about simply going virtual and perhaps for the future not even considering doing live shows because they're not going to be practical um, yeah, I, I, I've seen their argument and, and heard others make similar arguments. Uh, I don't agree, but it's an interesting point of view. Um, I don't agree because I think there are certain forms of performance uh, that simply do not fully blossom when they're not live. I mean, there's been a tremendous amount of magic on television during the past 70 years that television has been an option. Uh, and none of it is better than seeing magic done live and in person. In that sense, 
uh, you know, magic is, is, magic on television is very much like pornography. <laughs> I don't think you're the first one to make that comparison. No, I don't think I am, but, but I've been <laughs> saying it for some years. I mean, <laughs> this is not meant as, a, as an argument against pornography. <laughs> it has its merits, but it's never going to replace the real thing. Uh, that doesn't mean people can't aspire to create great pornography. <laughs> But it's never going to be better uh, yes. than, than the real thing. And, and I think, uh, unfortunately, I think that's true of magic. Hmm. Even when you start talking about newer media, like virtual reality, goggles, and all of that, yeah. there's something about a live performance. And this is true not only with magic, but it's true with theater. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I was saying this in a, in a, a different conversation recently. Uh, you know, film has evolved into its own medium. Yeah. And there are things you can do in movies that are using the form of movies. They're not simply trying to simulate or recreate a stage performance. Mm -hmm. So over time, film has become its own medium with ideas and rules and, and opportunities that didn't exist when film was first being used and when it was basically a way of recording something live. Well, magic hasn't had that breakthrough yet. And in fact, I think most live performing arts have not had that breakthrough. Uh, because what you're seeing on film is not theater. It's mm. film, it's something else. It's not unrelated, but it's not simply a recording of a live show. So your shows when like you go to see live theater, one of the things that makes it exhilarating, and this is true of live musical performances and one person shows or plays or everything in between and magic shows, you know that it's live. So you know that any moment, at any moment, something unexpected could happen, mm. even if that's highly unlikely. And, and that, provides a, a frisson, a, 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 an excitement and an energy uh, and a, a, a touch of danger um, that makes it more real in that moment than it would be watching it on video, even if it's a live video. Mm. So even, even the, the virtual shows that we're doing now, the live, live shows, they're going live to Facebook. Well, there's, there's literally a barrier exactly. in between performer and audience. Mm. So if something and goes wrong, you think get past that. Yeah, if something goes wrong, technically you think, well, speaking, if something street. goes horribly wrong hmm. uh, in in this conversation, you know, <laughs> we we could approach that in in various ways. Uh, hmm. You know, I don't know if you want your viewers to think that this is a live interview, but if you do want that, I'm about to destroy it because we're taping this. And, and, you're to going to, and you're going to tweak it. And I don't know how, how much tweaking you're going to do, but you may suddenly put in images, uh, the FISM logo or pictures of the Magic Castle or whatever topics, you know. Uh, apparently, you opened the show with a performance. Uh, and I will say, hypothetically, it was great. <laughs> but in reality, I haven't seen what the performance was. I'm hoping it's really good. And I haven't but, even done it yet. Well, so, so, so all of that kind of informs the experience of people watching this. Yeah, but then the difference is if this was to be a live experience on, uh, on Facebook Live where people can interact or like a Zoom show where I interact, it, 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 at least it's still not the same as a live show. Well, each each, person, uh, but it's, it's, each gradation it's, has a slightly different quality. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, you, and your show that you did, um, The Maximum Dimension, Again, that was taking a television version of magic to a different area. Yeah, that was a series I did in the mid to late 90s in Canada, uh, where I know this is hard to believe for most of your audience, but the target demographic for viewers was children 7 to 11 years old. And the show uh, used storylines and magic and games and puzzles to conquer math anxiety. Uh, we weren't actually teaching math. We were just getting kids comfortable with the idea that when math was proposed, they didn't automatically want to leave the room. 
And so that involved a fair amount of interactive material, uh, something that I've been exploring since the early 1980s. Uh, in 1984, I put out a video, which was at the very beginning of the home video era, uh, called Max Maven's Mind Games, the video that reads your mind. And that was all faux interactive. It was the illusion of interactivity. Hmm. Uh, and then a dozen years after that, uh, I, having done a, a lot of this faux material uh, on, on different television shows, I uh, had the opportunity to create a thing that had the unwieldy title of Max Magic, uh, but it was a, a, com a computer game for the Philips CDI system that really was interactive. Uh, so there were tricks and, and, and interactions that you really could make selections and, and the program would respond rather than on a videotape where if you played it twice, it would be exactly the same from the oh. side of the program. It was like a, um, like a choose your own adventure. In a way, yeah, yeah. And um, so I've had the chance to explore more than just the, the, the faux interactive material, although the faux interactive material does still play rather well. It does, it does indeed. And uh, of course our friend Dom Chambers did one on America's Got Talent a little while ago. Which uh, it was interesting. Yeah, there are people out there who are who are uh, developing new and interesting ideas in that field. Uh, I'd say most of them are just recycling the same, the same ideas. Uh, and most of what's being recycled started off as something they saw me do. Yes. Um, <laughs> but you did your research. I mean, as as evidenced in that chat you gave to Wonderground, where you um, <laughs> that well, you did all that interactive research of how far it went back. Yeah, I think if you're gonna if you're gonna explore things, you and this is true not only in terms of faux interactive magic, but in terms of all types of magic, uh, you want to know where you came from. Otherwise, you wind up you know those who do not know history are doomed to repeat it, and God knows magicians live up to that phrase with frequency. <laughs> Uh, better, I think, to have a sense of what's been done before, so that you can try and take it in new directions. And that's the, the key to it at the moment, because we have this opportunity with this new medium to take it in new directions. We don't have the opportunity to do magic live, which we would love to do, mm -hmm. but we have to make the best of what we've got. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, I, I love the fact that even back in the day when magic was on TV, and it was the early days of magic, there were shows that would try to work magic in, but they'd have to have a hook, like like shows like Celebra Cadabra, which you were a judge on. And of course, uh, the fullest franchise you did uh, in oh, Israel, the, yes. the, who, who can fool the master? You know, by, by having that conceit about it's a competition, it got people more interested in, in watching it. Whereas in theory, I'm the not time, sure. I mean, I mean, in theory, you need that that hook. Mm. Uh, but having said that, there's very little magic that shows up on on television these days that doesn't have a hook because mm. television producers presume that if you just put good magic on television nobody's going to want to watch. So you have to kind of cheat people into watching it. Well, magi uh, I'm magic not fans. Convinced that's true. Magic fans want to watch it, but uh, often what happens is, I mean, uh, as we've discussed about when even magic fans, when you're watching a magic show, sometimes sheerly by the poor selection of material, you are left instead of saying, wow, how was that done to going, why was that done? Sure. I, I would agree with that. Um, but uh, as long as television producers assume that you need to bait the hook with something additional, uh, we'll never know yeah, it's a good if, point. It, if it can't be done on its own merits. There has been very good magic presented on television, not only in my country, but around the world, hmm. uh, that has been allowed to stand on its own merits, but there hasn't been a lot of it. And usually when it happens, uh, it's because there is some connection to a celebrity, for example. You know, they're, they're one of the most exhilarating hours of, of magic that's ever been broadcast was in the 1970s on The Parkinson Show, which was a primetime uh, chat show on British TV, on the BBC. Uh, and on one episode, 
Michael Parkinson, who was a very popular host uh, in that country, uh, had on three magicians to perform and chat. Uh, and the magicians were Ricky Jay, Fred Capps, and Richie Ardy. Uh, it was a great show. It's still a great show if you can find a copy. Uh, there, I've seen it on YouTube, but unfortunately not very good quality uh, uh, video. But, uh, but that wouldn't have happened if it weren't for Michael Parkinson having the name value, the brand value of, of his show where he normally interviewed much more famous people and saying, no, no, we're going to treat these magicians as if they were the equivalent of top movie stars oh. or top hit record singers. Well, it's um, all about context, isn't it? Because if you're going to do magic with no context at all, there's no point in doing it. Well, but, but when left to its own devices, magic has succeeded on television. Again, despite the fact that I consider television to be inferior to live, <laughs> yeah. that doesn't mean that magic on TV is terrible. It just means it's never quite as good as what could be done live. But you know, when Doug Henning did his first special back in 1974, I think it was, or five, right around there, yeah. uh, he, he got huge ratings. Uh, now, this was a very different time. There were only three real national networks in the United States at that time, and he was on one of those three. I, he, so I think he could have come in a very weak third, and he didn't. I think he did have some celebrities on the show, though. Yeah, like two. Yeah, yeah. The celebrities were not, I mean, they were no, kind of insurance, but they were not a guarantee that people would tune in. Part mm. of it was that Doug himself mm. was starring at that time in a hit Broadway musical, yeah. The Magic Tomorrow. Yeah. And people had heard about this. So there was some buzz about Doug Henning. Mm. Uh, the other thing was that that first special, in addition to the, the next three, I think, they were all done live. Mm. At, at a time when most live television had stopped existing yeah. um, other than the news there really wasn't very much on american tv back in the 70s uh sports i guess that was being ca uh, carried live everything else was being taped and then adjusted if need be and henning's show which took risks uh, i think the fact that the audience was aware that, that it was live uh added something to it and it I, if memory serves, I think it won its, its, uh, its time slot. Uh, and, and more than just coming in first, I think it was record-breaking numbers. Now we fast forward 20 odd years. Uh, in the mid-90s, you have the first World's Greatest, uh, World's mm -hmm. Greatest Magic, was, mm -hmm. was the, uh, the title of a two-hour special mm -hmm. that aired on an American network on Thanksgiving evening. Now, in the U.S., Thanksgiving is a family holiday, and it's, the potential for a large viewing audience is great because people on that night are staying at home. Mm. Usually, they've had their, their meal has been in the late afternoon, and now it's nighttime, but most of them are, are stuffed from eating, and they haven't really made plans. Yeah. So they're going to stay at home, and the potential for a large viewing audience is vast. Mm. The problem is, what audience are you pitching to? because you have different demographics all in the same family group. Mm. And whereas today you can go off into your room and watch television on your computer screen or on your phone, that wasn't the case in, in the 1990s. It was a family event. So, yeah. So uh, I re at that time, it was still largely down to four networks. And I can tell you off the top of my head what was, what was airing on three of them. Uh, so on CBS, they showed The Wizard of Oz, the classic 1939 Hollywood movie. Mm -hmm. And of course, all the kids said, let's watch that. And the adults said, we've all seen it multiple times. <laughs> no. And on Fox, they had... Uh, an episode of, of, of Beverly Hills 90210, uh, which was aimed at adolescents. So, of course, they wanted to watch that, but
But the adults and the children said, we don't follow that series. We don't know who any of the characters are. We don't know any of the plot lines. No. NBC had this magic special that wasn't particularly geared toward any demographic. I do not know, uh, that was on NBC. I don't know what ABC was showing that night. I ought to look it up. But it seems to me that the choice of the magic special was everybody's second choice. Hmm. Everybody said, well, we can all agree that won't be terrible. It won't, you know, it, it won't lose our interest. Sure, hmm. why not? Let's give it a try. And it, to everyone's surprise, including the networks, it was the highest rated NBC special of that year. Uh, I don't, well, I know that NBC had no expectation of this. They thought it was simply a relatively low budget way to fill two hours on a night when audiences were not at all guaranteed to be watching. Mm. Uh, within 24 hours of its broadcast, they had signed up for four more annual specials uh, from the same production team. And that was a case where there weren't any big name stars. There were a few big names in the magic world, but not to, to, to any great extent were they particularly known to the average member of the public. Mm -hmm. And there were some celebrities, but they were kind of low level celebrities. They were, you know, fourth build actors from, from uh, nighttime soap operas or something yeah. who were known, but not, they weren't draws in and of themselves. Mm. So it was really the magic and, and the sort of perfect storm of circumstances mm. that led to huge ratings. And now we have uh, the shows like Dynamo and Chris Angel who have sort of become celebrities in themselves. So that's what attracts the, the audience. To some degree. I think Dynamo has, has clearly become a genuine celebrity in Britain. Mm. He's not particularly known to the American audience. I don't know if he's known in, in Australia, is he? He came, he came and did a, uh, a, a stadium tour. And, and did it uh, well? Sold out all the, the venues that he was in. And he was so that means that all of his television had shown. Yeah, yeah, because it wasn't okay, a case so that we the, wanted to see the US, yeah, was in the US, on TV. essentially no one has heard of him. Yeah. He got some press when he walked across the Thames River, mm. uh, a couple of other publicity stunts that got a little bit of traction, but not a lot. Mm. And he hasn't done any television work that I'm aware of in the United States. And therefore, if he tried to mount a show, a live show in the US, it wouldn't work at this time. Well, um, ironically, I know in England he has he has done tours in in within the last yeah. several years where he's filled up stadiums that that hold ten to fifteen thousand people or more. Yeah, to watch close up on the screen. Yeah, but the yeah. um, the uh, special he's just released, uh, the last trick in it is he walks through Trump's border wall. I actually was uh, one of the people who advises on the show. And I assume it's known, but just in case it's not, I won't mention his name, but he showed me some photographs uh, of that. So I have not seen the actual performance, but the idea itself was pretty clever. Yeah. I, how did it look? Weird. <laughs> okay. It's, it's sort of like, um, essentially there's the wall, there's the, the slits in the wall where you can't fit through. Obviously a person can't fit through, otherwise there's no point in having the wall. So he just gets up to it and he puts his arm through and squeezes through and goes through. And it's sort of I'm weird. Sure that's a great effect to do when you're as skinny as he is. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's sort of I mean, what you're describing sounds like, it, it sounds like you're, you would watch it and say, huh, I wouldn't have thought he could fit, but I guess he can. <laughs> exactly. And, and the whole special, he's been talking about how he's sick with his arthritis and his conditions, Crohn's disease, and he gets very fat in the face and stuff. And then the medication brings him back down to regular size. And so you're thinking, well, Maybe, you know. <laughs> Maybe he took extra medication? Yes. So he's like an octopus. Yeah, he's like an octopus. You know, an octopus can get through, I forget what the size of the hole is, but a, a really large octopus can get through a, so, a hole that's really small. Yeah. The only size issue is the beak of the octopus. Well, that, well, that was the equivalent of Dynamo's baseball cap because the baseball cap fell off during the thing and they were like, Hey man, you forgot your cap. Oh, that's funny. And they were going, it doesn't even fit through. The cap doesn't fit through. 
<laughs> They're like, turn it sideways, it'll fit, but you know, okay. <laughs> well, it obviously worked because you're talking about it. Absolutely, but but again, it, 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 it was not it was not a Great Wall of China type of effect. It was more like, oh, I've just walked to the great the border wall. I'm just going to slip through. Okay, bye. You know, it, it's his style. You know, he's not not going in with the fanfare that Copperfield did and the drama yeah. that Copperfield did, or creating that sense sort of sensation. It's more like, oh, I'm going to go through. Okay, see you on the other side. Yeah. But it's fascinating. Magic on television is such a, a, a bizarre thing. And I, I still don't think, I mean, a Justin Wilman special was very good, but I, I still don't think anyone's really mastered the whole art of magic on television. I, I think, I think one, one guy I did see who I thought was coming close was uh, Cyril with some of his Japanese specials. And just the way... Yes, he... well, I think one of the things that Cyril has done uh, and one of the reasons why his stuff has become so popular in the places that he is been promoted, which is to say Asia, because they really haven't tried promoting him in the US sure. or, or in Europe. But it's because he does location material in locations you can recognize and feel like, oh yeah, I was at an, an equivalent place last week. You know, I was at a fast food restaurant last week. Uh. And he is now in a fast food restaurant that looks like it has all the same conditions of the one that I'm familiar with. Mm. Uh, also, most of what Cyril has done uh, has not involved gargantuan props. Um, gargantuan props, if used well, can make a good impression on television. But I think in general, they're better at selling people on the idea of tuning in than the actual results. Yeah. And I don't say that to besmirch people like David Copperfield. David has done some phenomenally good things involving giant props, such as uh, we, we touched upon a moment ago, the Great Wall of China, which mm -hmm. arguably is the largest magic prop ever, <laughs> ever constructed. Um, but... On, and I'm not the only person to have said this, uh, although I might have been one of the earliest to say it, but on a television camera, um, you know, a glass is the same size as the Statue of Liberty. Well, that's what I loved about Copperfield's early specials, the way he would do a big scene with an illusion with a decolta chair, and then in the same act, he'd get some matchboxes out and make the matchboxes move. Right. And it was just I remember there was, there was one year when, when David did his special, and I honestly don't remember which year it was, so I don't remember what the big publicity stunt was. But the one thing that the lay public talked about after that special was pushing a cigarette through a quarter, yep. a cigarette to coin. And I, I remember David expressing frustration. Uh, <laughs> This would have been, I think, in the very early 80s, somewhere like 81 or something. Uh, but frustration with, the, with that's what they talked about, not the, the stuff that cost a fortune and, and tremendous amounts of rehearsal and, and, and so forth. But I have to say, I think David overall has, has understood the television medium better than most. Uh, obviously, uh, I would include Cyril in that rather small group, and I think... Uh, uh, you have to mention David Blaine in that context, although I, uh, I'm less interested in what David has been do doing in his more recent shows uh, than in his earlier shows. But that, that is as, has as much to do with my personal tastes as anything else. Uh, but, but some of the appearances that you've made have not even been magic. Things like as a driving instructor on Mork and Mindy. Well, that was, that was acting. <laughs> uh, that was that was a, a bunch of producers deciding that they could do something with this image, uh, and I have done a handful of those. The Fresh uh, Prince of Bel Air, Fresh Prince of Bel Air, where I played. This was an acting stretch. I played a theatrical hypnotist, <laughs> the great Mentos. <laughs> uh, yes, that was the name of the character. But that, that's I, I love the fact that because you do have such a distinctive image, people just, we've well, got to get him on the show. The great Mentos character was written with me in mind. Uh, the, the fellow who, who was part of the, I mean, they had a writer's room that had a whole, whole bunch of people. But one of them was the one who pitched the basic premise of the episode, also 
knew me casually. And so he said, I think I know who would be great for this part. Having said that, I had to go in and read for it. And it could have been that the producers and casting people said, no, that's not what we envisioned. So someone else could have gotten that. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you just heard a horn uh, yeah. in the background. You're about to hear a lot of cheers and applause. Oh, it's, it's the... Not the... for me. <laughs> uh, in New York, every night at 7 o'clock, uh, people cheer and whistle and, and applaud out of their apartment windows. Um, I, I can't say how this is, is in other parts of the country, but here in this particular corner of Hollywood, this particular street, they've started doing it every night at eight o'clock local time. Mm. Why it's eight instead of seven, I don't know, but it is. And, and so anyone wondering what time of day it was, it's the, it's for me, screen. when we were shooting this, it's exactly eight o'clock on the, on the screen. The, the idea of it is that they're supposed to be uh, cheering the... Uh, As they come home from, yeah, from the hospital. Yes, yeah, yeah, so I guess yeah. maybe they've got different shift times. Uh, in I have no idea. I mean, I, I, I don't know that 7 o'clock is the correct time in New York. I mean, it's, uh, hypothetically, it's when people come home. But I think medical personnel have shifts that start and stop around the clock. Mm. So do the majority come home at 7? I, I don't know that that's true. But anyway, for whatever reason, in this neck of the woods, it's at eight. There are still a couple of stragglers, but they usually stop after one minute. I hear, I hear a few in the distance who are still prolonging it. But people like traditions. They like to have some something they can just do every yeah. every day that, that will give them a bit of consistency. Because I mean, the, the the whole world has been turned upside down. There, and well, that's people, true. And I think some of the people who are engaging in this cheering or what have you are really taking this as an opportunity to vent. Uh, and I don't mean by that that they're angry in, in what they're, in the noise they're making. Uh, because I think, I think it is motivated by a sense of expressing appreciation. But I think for some of them, it just feels good to let it out. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, we're talking about your image. Um, and oh. one of the things I was going to say was that I, I'm surprised that you haven't had more opportunities of, of late, uh, for example, to do things like hosting the Twilight Zone or something like that. It would seem to be a natural fit. Well, I'll give you a sad but, but honest answer to that. Uh, television, at least in this country, and then as far as I've observed in most parts of the world, is not really interested in people of my age. I understand that. I've heard that many times. Um, I remember going, this is not that many years ago, uh, within the last five or 10 years, I went to a pitch meeting with a producer uh, to pitch him several ideas for television projects, any one of which I could have hosted. And I went with my manager and as we were driving to the producer's office, my manager said, you know, you should be don't be married to the idea that you're going to get booked to host these because <laughs> they're really at this point, they're looking for people who are 24. Mm. And so, you know, if they through some fluke decide to book you as the host, great, but don't be committed to that idea because the odds are good that if they do buy a premise, they're going to attach it to a 24 year old. And, um, uh, during the meeting at a certain point, the producer said, no, I'm, I'm sorry, my manager said 22 year old. <laughs> and in the meeting, the producer said, you realize of course that even though you, you would be more than uh, good at, at the job of hosting this, uh, we're really, these days what, what they want are 24 year olds. At which point I turned to my manager and said, ha! <laughs> Well, the thing is, that the film industry is now having a bit of a resurgence with people in their 60s and 70s and 80s. And yes. Will the television industry catch up to that at any point when they, when um, they realize would, there's a market? I would like to think that they will before I'm dead. You know, I mean, there, there's only so much of a window yes. uh, for, for television to catch up. But at this moment, you know, it's just there's, a, there's a, a series that in this country airs on Amazon Prime called Bosch. Uh, you familiar with this show? Yes. Uh, 
it's based on a series of novels by Michael Connolly. There have been 16 or 17 of these novels and I've read them all and they're fun and they're good. And the television uh, adaptation is, is quite well done. And so I've been enjoying watching them. They just released the fifth or sixth season a week or so back, which I happily binge watched. Um, but one of the things that makes watching it novel is that not only is it a well done series, well cast, well produced, it takes place in LA, so I recognize all the locations and so forth, but there's the sheer novelty of watching a, a, a series, a television series, where the protagonist is close to my age. Mm -hmm. And you suddenly realize how, how unusual that is. Well, in now, I'm not saying that's, I'm certainly not saying that's a good thing mm. or it's something that I support, nor do I think it's something that is borne out by, uh, by testing. I, I don't know, you know, the presumption is that young people, the most coveted audience, uh, which is generally speaking 18 years to 30s or 40s, mm. and there's this assumption that people uh, of that age range won't watch older performers. Mm. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily true, mm. but since when did truth have anything to do with the decisions made by television executives? Well, that is absolutely correct. So uh, what, what do you think then, uh, with the age uh, put aside slightly for the moment, what do you think uh, the future for the magic industry when we come back and we get back into live performances? Are there performers uh, who are... You know, because I know, I know there are a couple of performers. I, I know we mentioned Dom Chambers and Carissa Hendricks, people who were sort of on that upward trajectory and have now right. been cut short. And now they've got to hit pause. They've got to hit pause and hopefully come back on, on full tilt. Yeah. Uh, who, who do you tag as the, the upcoming people to look for? My guess is that we don't know them yet. Um, I think that some of the current performers who are on upward trajectories, will manage to resume that when things return to some version of normalcy. Um, and there are some who never regain the momentum. But I think the next big thing in magic is probably someone who hasn't surfaced at all yet. Hmm. Uh, but there are just so many unknowns at this particular juncture. We don't know there are people who are proclaiming that live performed magic will never be the same. Mm. Well, I'm not convinced that's true. Uh, you know, the last time there was a pandemic of this magnitude was, you know, compressed into a small time period was the Spanish, the so-called Spanish flu of, of, of 102 years ago, mm. um, which killed a lot of people and set show business back on its heels for, for some years, but then things got restored and there were no significant changes made. Hmm. If anything, the fact that movies became increasingly popular and then with the advent of sound in the late twenties became overwhelmingly popular and few venues were more crowded than movie theaters during the 1930s. Mm. Uh, so the notion that we are going to avoid big crowds as a result of this, uh, I think the public is going to break that soon because they want to go to big sporting events. They want to go to big concerts. They want to go to nightclubs and, and, and theaters and other events. And, uh, you know, it's going to take some sort of a solution in the form of, uh, theoretically a vaccine or herd immunity or uh, remarkable treatments that don't yet exist, uh, but they will find a way to relegate these concerns to being much less. And I think we will go back to much of what we do or what we were doing. Uh, I think the biggest change, my guess, I could be completely wrong about this because nobody knows for sure. And that certainly includes me. But I think one of the biggest changes in magic is going to be that certain types of activity will be dropped. I'll give you a perfect example. David Blaine did a special recently, and one of the tricks in the special was a thing that he's been doing in live shows, 
uh, where he has his lips sewn shut. I don't see why he has to stop doing that, <laughs> nor do I see a lot of other people jumping to, <laughs> to, to copy it. But the actual trick that takes place after his lips are sewn shut is that a selected playing card disappears and is found in his mouth. Well, there's a whole field of magic where things come out of a person's mouth, and maybe we're done with that now. No more mouth coils? I think we may, because when magic opens up again, when performing opens up again, it's not going to be like turning a switch that suddenly it, everything is okay again. There will be issues that are eventually no longer a concern, but there will be concerns at first. And the ones that will really have a big deal to do with are things that probably will be uh, banished and never welcomed back. And I think that includes any trick where something comes out of your mouth. Uh, tricks that involve people hugging on stage. Uh, you know, there's, there are going to be new rules of, of, uh, of what is acceptable. We're, we're already in the middle of some things of that sort anyway. Uh, you know, there used to be a whole field in magic of cigarette magic. Yep. Well, it's gone now. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a handful of people who still do cigarette magic, but uh, they are a dwindling number for various reasons. Mm -hmm. And anyone who takes up cigarette magic at this moment is a fool. Because in every country in the world, with the exception of a couple of corners of Asia, cigarette smoking is not only disappearing, but if you bring out a cigarette on stage, you will offend people in the audience. Mm -hmm. Some may actually get up and leave or, or yell things at you, at least in this country. And it seems to be increasingly that in other parts of the world. So cigarettes as a prop are basically done. And some of the glorious work that was done with cigarettes, I mean, there was some great cigarette magic. Uh, but a century or, or, or so of cigarette magic is now gone and there will be some ideas from cigarette magic that people will repurpose. Hmm. You know, Chad Long came up uh, with an idea uh, several years ago where he took uh, one of these, hmm. a USB drive, a thumb drive, and created a paddle routine. So it was something, you know, seen in the real world hmm. that, that you could do magic with that didn't seem like some bizarre antiquated prop that you, you bought at a magic shop. Well, these are not that dissimilar in size and, and shape to a cigarette. So many of the moves, and don't look at me to do any of them, but <laughs> many of the moves or, or effects that you would do with a cigarette could be transferred over to a thumb drive or yeah. to a, a, a golf pencil or to a, a crayon or various small objects. But cigarettes themselves, I think, Hmm. They're gone. Well, there's so many. And it so many may methods. be that smoke magic in general is gone. Because, hmm. you know, there's been a lot of stuff happening in the last few years of, of gimmicks for producing smoke, hmm. uh, most of them using essentially the technology of vaping yeah. to create smoke effects. You know, the, the smoke just sort of appears, the coin vanishes, and, and the puff of smoke takes hmm. its place. Well, I. I don't know. People are, are much more alert to the idea of what you're breathing in mm. when it comes to the coronavirus. And it may be that when magic starts to get its footing again in live performance, producing a substance that, that the audience breathes is not okay. Well, even and all of this exciting new technology mm. may never fully catch on. I don't know, but, but that may not be acceptable in terms of what is, is okay in the new magic. But I have to say that I think those will be less common than the things that people just go right along doing the way they did five years ago, 50 years ago. Well, even 15 years ago, when we, did, uh, we had some fake cigarettes in a show, it was about gangsters. We had to, because we're part of a festival, we had to put signs on the door saying, warning, fake cigarettes are used in this show. 
Yeah. Uh, because, you know, people are very conscious of, of those. They've been conscious of those things for a long time. Yeah. But you're right. There's, there's going to be some big changes that will come out of the other side once we, we move out of this. Uh, but I'm not sure how big those changes will be. That's the point I'm making. I think there will be changes. I think some of them we can't even predict or imagine as to what suddenly is not acceptable in the course of an entertainment. Um, well, he's I'm, guessing that, I'm guessing that a magician performing five years from now mm. will be sadly not that different from a, from a magician who was performing five years ago. Here's the interesting thing. Cruise ships, uh, on which I do maybe 10 or 13 shows a year, have now reported their bookings have never been higher for advanced gigs. So, yes. so people but, still wanting to go back to what they... Well, I think there's... I mean, familiar with. In, in the specific area of cruise ships, I think there are certainly... Uh, there are concerns. Mm, After all, cruise ships was one of the very first type of place outside of China. Mm. You know, when this first hit, it was, it seemed to be limited to certain parts of China and then Asia in general. And mm. then people said, oh no, it's actually spreading through Europe. Oh no, it's now come to the Americas and, and what have you. But cruise ships were some of the earliest places that got publicity as having had outbreaks of coronavirus. Yeah. Um, people will go back on cruise ships if they believe that there is containment such that you can go on a cruise ship and because it is isolated, mm. they'll say, well, it's like a miniature New Zealand. <laughs> you know, uh, if there's a way that a cruise ship company can promote the idea that their, their preparations, their, mm. their filters for cleaning and, and screening all passengers and you're, all personnel you're safe are so safe. good that you can be safe on that ship for mm. two weeks. You don't have to worry about anything. Mm. Uh, then, yeah, I would imagine the cruise ship uh, bookings would, would be huge until the first time it failed. <laughs> but there's and also when that the, happens, the cruise ship market will probably tank. Yeah. But there's also the people who are just being defiant, the people who are just still... Um, saying, I'm not, I'm not going to get into this whole coronavirus thing. I'm not going to buy into it. I, you know, I'm going to stand up. I'm going to go outside. And yeah. it's, it's crazy. Unfortunately, as, as has been observed by many people, the virus doesn't care what you think. <laughs> the virus doesn't say, oh, he seems defiant. He seems brave. I'll pass. <laughs> the virus says, a new opportunity. I'll go there. Yeah. So, you know. Well, it looks like you are self-isolating very well. Uh, well, I've been doing it now for about eight weeks. Mm -hmm. I started at the early end of, of things uh, because I am high risk. So the same, the same things that keep me from getting booked on television also <laughs> keep me from going out of my apartment. Uh, my age and underlying conditions are such that I didn't mess around with this early on. I said, I'm, I ought to stay home. And my doctor agreed. So, uh, you know, I consider myself to be very lucky. Uh, I have lots of books. I have music. I have television, streaming video, internet connection. Uh, in this particular area, getting deliveries of food, both uh, restaurant delivery meals and, and groceries and such from markets uh, is, is pretty easy to arrange. Uh, most other things that I would need to acquire, I can get by mail. So, and, and I'm, I'm not rich, but I'm not poor. So the fact that as with almost everybody in, in this industry, uh, all of my work has vanished uh, but having said that, I'm okay for the time being. Uh, so I'm not sitting around worrying about how I'm going to make uh, enough money to live for the next month. Although there are plenty of people in the magic field mm. who are undoubtedly going through that. Um, so I consider myself to be in a very lucky position. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say, therefore, I'm enjoying this situation because I'm not. But it's something I can put up with uh, for the foreseeable future. 
And I think, unfortunately, it's going to be long, a, a long haul on this. I don't think anything is going to radically change anytime soon. Boy, do I hope that prediction is wrong. But I, but I, but I, I think this is going to be in for the long haul. And then there will be some slow adjustments, but in very limited ways. And for us to get back to a sort of normal interface between people, probably a couple of years down the line to, to be completely past this. I think you are, you are right. And I, I, I know you've probably got a prediction envelope sealed in the background that you'll open up at the end of the virus. No, but I could be writing this off screen. How would you know? <laughs> oh, I can't wait for the first Max Maven live Zoom show. <laughs> I think you're going to wait a while longer. <laughs> uh, it's not that I don't have material. You've got plenty of material. I, 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 I have plenty of material in my existing repertoire that can be done in the circumstance of a, a, a Zoom call where I can't physically touch uh, the person watching. I can't hand a prop over and yet I can still create magical experiences. But having said that, it isn't what I, it's, it's not something I ever set out to do. Hmm. And it, it, it's not particularly appealing to me at this time. Yeah. It doesn't mean I might, I, I reserve, I always reserve the right to change my mind. But at the moment, I'm not looking to do that, even though I have, you, you can't see my desk, which is lucky because it's chaotic, but I have things sitting within arm's reach that I could suddenly pick up and go into doing. Uh, so I'm not ignoring the ideas. But now you've, now you've said that everywhere watching is going, what's he going to do? What's he going to perform? Leave them wanting more. Exactly. That's the best way to do it. And thank you so much for spending this time chatting with us. We're going to leave. It's been my way. pleasure. <laughs> uh, I'm glad to see you safe and secure on, on the other side of the globe. Yep. Yeah, we, we, uh, we, are, we are on the verge. Uh, I know uh, New Zealand is on the verge of opening. Uh, yeah. Because they've had zero cases. Uh, Australia, yeah, but, but they're going to be really tight about who they allow to come in. They, they're saying that September... They will open up Australia and New Zealand, you know, travel between the two countries and possibly, uh -huh. possibly Singapore as well. But I think, mm -hmm. I think it's going to be quite a long time before we get to visit America again. Unfortunately, I think you're right. And I think some of the reasons for that are, are, are pathetic and terrible, but mm -hmm. we'll, we'll save that political conversation for another day. Uh, in the meantime, I don't know what you in the other nations of the world see as to what's going on in this country. Uh, on American television news, we see a lot of terribly bad behavior, uh, but that is not all that's happening. Yeah. Uh, I'm happy to say that on the West Coast, uh, I'm in California, and California was the first state to urge its citizens to stay indoors and, and to self isolate and, and, and to, to behave in a way that was intelligent and safe. And as a result, despite California being one of the largest populations in the United States, it, it's surprisingly not that bad as far as the percentage of population that has been affected, which is not to say we haven't had lots of cases, mm -hmm. but we're doing better than a lot of other areas have and hopefully we will maintain this and avoid the giant resurgence that is hovering around the corner and that's going to hit some parts of the United States massively. Well, the crazy thing is, uh, it, it's almost, I mean, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but it is on the charts that states could end up having to close their borders. Yeah, I'm not even sure how you would do that, the way this country is constructed. Yeah, I don't. I think it could be aspired to, but I don't think it can actually be successfully done. Mm. Um, but that's that's further on down the line. Yeah, I just wish people would behave more intelligently right now. It would be good. Well, thank you for your guidance and suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> good to see you. Um, um, to everyone who may be watching, wherever you are, I hope you're 
I hope you're playing safe and uh, and and exploring magic with uh, with safe parameters. Good advice. Thank you so much. See you later. <laughs>